Greetings collectors and welcome to today's show. One of the great advantages of gaming is the ability to travel to faraway fantasy lands and go on epic quests. Today we're going to attempt just that in today's retrospective of Battlemaster for the Commodore Amiga. Battlemaster was released back in 1990 for the Commodore Amiga, Atari ST, Sega Genesis and the DOS PC. Whilst not particularly well known today, I wanted to revisit Battlemaster as I see it as one of the forgotten classics. I'm sure that many of you will have fond memories of this game, others will be experiencing it for the first time. So let's see what's included in the package. The full size box is very solid with excellent cover art. A well printed glossy manual with detail on weapons, monsters, items and back lore of this fantasy realm. There's the ever present warranty card. I think I'm still yet to ever have posted one of these back to a company. More importantly though is the single 3.5 inch floppy disk. In addition, here is probably the most interesting box content. It's an A3 sized laminated map containing all of the major locations in the game and acts as an extra tool to help get you immersed in the world of Battlemaster. The rear of the box really sells the game. It promises top quality arcade action. A huge detailed fantasy world to explore, complete with castles, villages and underground mines. 16 different leaders from 4 different races to choose from, devious puzzles, fiendish traps and countless magic objects. Fight, negotiate or trade extra troops, adopt your own battle formations. The game certainly talks the talk, we'll see later how this all plays out. You'll notice on the front of the box the promotional sticker for free accommodation for a great escape. If you remember back to the theme park mystery episode we collected our first coupon. Collect 5 of these and you can redeem the coupons at over 200 locations in the UK. With Battlemaster you'll find this coupon on the back of the manual. So to get that free accommodation you're going to have to sacrifice a rather nice piece of art to do so. The worst crime against the game packaging though is the promotional sticker on the front of the box. I dare say that it will peel off without damaging the artwork below, but it's probably not worth the risk. As you've noticed the artwork itself is actually an exceptional piece of cover artwork. The artwork is by Cypriot born Chris Achilleos. Over the years Chris has worked on numerous pieces of fantasy artwork. If you're interested in this type of art I would highly recommend checking out his website for his full portfolio. You won't be disappointed. So on to the game. As you boot up you'll see a digitised version of the cover art. It's reasonably well imagined but I believe that the Amiga palette could have actually produced an even better result. The setup screen allows us the basic option of choosing our leader for the quest. There are four basic races of human, elf, dwarf and orc. The manual states that there are differences between the races although I didn't really experience this effect in the game. Humans are supposed to have certain advantage over elves, elves over humans etc. As this didn't really seem to have much effect, I would suggest just picking your favourite. What does matter though is the class that you pick. I tend to pick the wizard class as they seem to have better projectiles for killing the enemies at range. Once you've got your team together, it's on to the core gameplay. This is the view of the game that you'll see for about 99% of your time whilst playing. The view is top down and allows you to control one member of your group. This is indicated by the red arrow over his head. The aim is to eliminate a target number of enemy. There's no on screen counter for this but this is explained in the game manual. The enemy themselves can be seen on the radar map at the bottom right of the screen. The sidebar also shows your stats of health, morale and skill. Overall though there's really only the health bar that you'll want to keep a regular eye on. Before long you'll be free roaming around the map using the radar to help guide you towards the next pack of enemies. One thing that you've perhaps noticed is the overall level of graphics and sound. For the Commodore Amiga I would describe them very much as entry level. When you compare games like Shadow of the Beast to Battlemaster there's a rather large gap in quality. I have an assumption as to why that might be and that comes down to the publisher PSS. They were better known for games on the Auric microcomputer as well as other lower spec machines and mostly top down war strategy games at that. What looks to have happened here is a combination of moving up to a more capable system but also the way the game would be marketed. Three of the major releases of the game were the DOS PC, 
Atari ST and the Commodore Amiga. Out of these three systems, it's arguable that the Commodore Amiga was the most capable at the time. Without having to make any major rewrites, the game would need to run on the least capable system, arguably either the DOS or Atari ST formats. This would explain why the Amiga version also seems to have been hobbled when it comes to the graphics. The extended colour palette capable certainly wasn't used here. Considering PSS's legacy working with ports and less powerful systems, I think it's safe to assume that it's at least partially how the game was developed. However, graphics aren't everything, we need to look at the gameplay. The gameplay itself is rather a mixed bag, the choppy frame rate can make it difficult to engage the enemies with any strategy. It invariably turns into a case of either picking off enemies with projectiles at a distance, or running up close enough to the enemy and spamming the fire button in the hopes of landing a hit. The maps are a decent size for this type of game, and all have a reasonable layout. What is frustrating about the game though is the number of cheap deaths in the game. You can be walking along quite happily, then all of a sudden, death. There's not a lot you can do about this as traps spawn at random locations and at random times. So these trap features aren't easily avoidable. You'll just have to play the game a few times, memorize the locations and never cross these paths. Personally, I felt that this feature actually detracted from the gameplay. The idea of booby trap rooms itself is a good one. The execution though just doesn't add to the adventure as the death always feels very cheap and unavoidable. After each stage, you'll return to the map screen, where you'll find that you have a branching path. Here I can either go to Dorin's Delve or Dullum. In this case I've chosen to go to Dullum. With a name like Dullum, I'm expecting great excitement. After a quick loading screen, we reach our next destination. You'll notice a nice change in the graphics, away from the dull browns and greys into a more green environment, although still very tile-based in appearance. You'll also notice what's going on here. It can get very confusing as to what's actually happening. My team are down at the bottom, I'm controlling the character with the red arrow, whilst the computer assists with the two companions. Unfortunately, the enemy look absolutely identical in every way. Before long, there is so much action on the screen, it can become very confusing as to where you are, who you are, and who you're attacking. Even a simple sprite palette swap would have helped greatly here. Throughout the game, you'll be exploring different houses, caves, and other locations. You'll be picking up extra food, armour, keys, rings, amulets, and a range of other items. The game has all the elements of a great RPG, similar to Ultima and other popular series at the time. The problem with Battlemaster is that it never seems that necessary to collect most items other than keys, armour, and food. You'll find that you collect lots of items, equip them in the menu screen, but find they only have a very nominal influence in the gameplay, if at all. Pressing spacebar will take you to the menu screen. From there you can bring up the inventory. There's a complete list of your findings including weapons and food. Here for example, I'm able to equip the lesser shield ring. Interestingly, here is possibly the most laziest description of an in-game item I've ever seen. Just a label of food of some kind. It's not very helpful and I'm not even sure if this was an in-joke by the developers, or they just forgot to go back and name all of the game attributes. You can also click on the profile of your character. This opens up a secondary stats screen. Here you can view your character's health, morale, and skill. In theory, this should be a very useful screen in an RPG adventure. However, I personally found that other than the health bar, these statistics really didn't seem to influence the gameplay. Supposedly, you're leveling up your stats as you play. You'll be hard pushed to see the effect of these stat progressions though, as you're playing through the game. Battlemaster is a case where all the right elements of the game are in here, it's just that they don't come together very cohesively as one piece. So overall we've got some dubious graphics, limited sound, and the gameplay is a little lacking in places. However, for whatever reason I really enjoy playing Battlemaster. It's challenging, not necessarily in the right way, but it did keep me coming back for more time and time again. I've been playing Battlemaster on and off since I was about 10 years old, so I'll fully admit that at least part of the enjoyment here, at least for myself, is nostalgia. In short bursts, it's a fun game to revisit and a decent experience as long as you don't compare it to more grand adventure titles it was up against in the 1990s. This is throwaway fun, but really good throwaway fun. Aside from nostalgia though, why am I showing you Battlemaster as a collectible? 
Well, one of the game's developers, Mike Simpson, is actually still involved in the game's industry. He's currently the creative director of the Creative Assembly. Now, you probably know these for titles such as the Total War franchise. It's interesting when you look back, though, through his LinkedIn profile, how much he's achieved through the years. Even being the studio manager at Psygnosis, and this was back in the day when classics such as Shadow of the Beast 2, Blood Witch, and Microcosm were around. So, this is a person that did go on to, dare I say, better games, and influential in his own right. It's interesting to go back further on Mike's profile, when he actually mentions his time working for PSS and Mirosoft, and openly states that some of the earlier games were made for as little as £3,000, and developed in just three months. He does go on to say that some had higher budgets. It's always interesting to see how someone went on to such great things would still include this earlier work on his profile. It's a really nice piece of nostalgia that shows the progress of a developer in the gaming industry. You don't have to start out at the top, you can start out with a game like Battlemaster and work your way up. This is an additional reason as to why I think Battlemaster is interesting, at least from a historical perspective. So, if you're thinking of collecting this one, how much is it going to cost you? The online auction site suggests that this title isn't really gaining in value at the moment. Anywhere from 10 to 15 pounds in the UK is about right for a complete in-box copy. For the US, expect to pay anywhere from 15 to 20 dollars, and of course that is for the Commodore Amiga version. There is a Sega Genesis version of the game. Expect to pay around 5 dollars for this edition. The reason that the Genesis version is interesting to us here in the UK is that Battlemaster was never released by Sega in PAL territories. This poses the added inconvenience for collectors here in Europe, as we have to import this version. I have played the Sega Genesis version of Battlemaster, and I can conclude that there's virtually no difference between them, if at all. If anything, the sound is very slightly better on the Commodore Amiga version, but there's very little in it. Battlemaster probably won't be the most exciting game in your collection, but it is at least interesting from a collecting point of view. The game boasts a lot on the box and possibly falls a little short of expectations. However, the box, the manual and the map are all excellent quality and provided me with that nice warm feeling of old school gaming nostalgia. As a package, Battlemaster is well worth tracking down. The overall game build is perhaps lacking in places, but Battlemaster is a game I come back to time and time again. If you spent just 5 minutes trying this one, you'd probably put it down and never come back to it. Play 20 minutes though, and you'll find yourself coming back time and time again, wanting to progress to that next level and finally complete the game. For the reasonable price of picking up a copy of the game, I'd give Battlemaster a recommendation for anyone looking for some simple adventure fun. Hello again, I hope you enjoyed today's show and thank you for the view. Remember, you can always comment, like, subscribe and find us on the social media sites below. Happy collecting!